What's up, guys? I'm still here with Malcolm. We're going to talk a little bit more about startup strategy. I've got five risky players to avoid in startup drafts. Uh, so basically, we just picked out five guys that at their current prices in uh, Dynasty startups are a little bit risky, and we'd kind of rather go elsewhere with our picks. We're going to list them in reverse order of ADP, so a little top five countdown. And I'm going to kick things off with Jordan Love. He's currently going at the 701 as the QB 21 off the board. And I think I've made this case on the podcast before, but I just think he's too risky at his price. Uh, basically, he's he was a late first round NFL pick. He had kind of a flawed prospect profile. Usually when you go that late in the NFL draft as a quarterback, you do. He hasn't played over the last three years sitting behind Aaron Rodgers. Now he gets a one-year audition with the Packers with a pretty inexperienced group of weapons. They gave him an extension that isn't a real commitment. They can very much get out from under him if he underwhelms this season. So I don't know. The downside here is pretty obvious. Like He's basically a rookie quarterback without the value insulation. He doesn't project as a useful fantasy asset for the season. When you look at his ADP on platforms like Underdog, he's not being drafted as if he's going to be a useful quarterback. So if you have a guy you're not going to want to start who's going into his fourth season and could very easily bottom out as an asset, I don't really see the upside in that type of investment. And we just saw Daniel Jones last year in a similar spot going into his fourth year, had an unimpressive track record. He puts together a great year, QB one season, wins a playoff game, gets a big contract. And what does he get for all that? Right? He gets a round four startup ADP. So I don't know what's the, what's the real ceiling outcome for Jordan love. Even if he can do everything that Daniel Jones just did, and he doesn't even have that kind of a rushing ability. Is he really going to see these, this massive gain to justify his price? What do you think about Jordan love Malcolm? Yeah. I mean, I'm pretty much right there with you as a huge fan of the show. I've been had, <laughs> having to hear about Jordan love just about every week uh, that I listen to it, but yeah, you broke it down really well here. You broke it down really well with Jagger. Um, I, I, I definitely agree. Like Daniel Jones, he was just a QB one. I mean, albeit a pretty low end one. And yeah, he just made it to the fourth round. I don't think Jordan Love rushes even kind of as much as Daniel Jones does. So I think a lot of people are really just hoping that he got to sit behind Aaron Rodgers for three years, same way that Aaron Rodgers sat behind Brett Favre. And then Jordan Love will just turn into the next Aaron Rodgers. And that's a pretty... I think it's a pretty big ask, right? But just yeah. want want him to be one of the best quarterbacks of all time. I think it's much more likely that if Jordan Love, and it's it's really important to note that, yeah, like you said, this extension that he got is not a fifth year option. It's actually less money than a fifth year option, and it's a much easier for them to get out of. So they're really not committed to him at all. And I think it's much more likely than uh I think it's much more likely for Jordan Love to be priced outside the top 15 rounds by next year than to be the next Aaron Rodgers or anything close to that. I think yeah, he'd right. have to rush way more than he ever has to get into the fourth round like Daniel Jones. And with the weapons that he has, I just I just don't see him becoming a great passer. We've seen if, nothing to indicate that. If he wasn't wearing a Packers jersey, there wouldn't be any reason to compare him to Aaron Rodgers. It's just, it's a little bit of a lazy narrative. You get this yeah. late first round pick who sits for a few years behind a quarterback. And so obviously it's going to work out the same way. It's probably not going to. It's just, it's kind of a small win, big loss type of bet, which I, I really don't like to make in dynasty. Um, you know, what, like Russell Wilson is going later in the same round from Jordan love. I, I would just rather have Russell Wilson. Mm -hmm. I would much rather have Brock Purdy two full rounds later. I'd rather have Matthew Stafford four rounds later. There's just nothing about his price that makes sense. So that's an avoid uh, risky player that I don't want to click. Uh, the next guy on our list is DK Metcalf who goes at the 406 as the wide receiver 16 off the board. Malcolm, why don't you make the case against DK Metcalf? Yeah, I mean, I think we're probably going to agree here. Um, so I think besides his age, which, I mean, he's still pretty young, the only case you can really make for DK uh, is what you and Chris were talking about two weeks ago with expected points per game. DK had 15.5, which would be good for wide receiver 12. Unfortunately, expected points per game are not points per game. Uh, so... I haven't seen anyone do the predictability about expected points per game, so I know it might be flawed. We've seen DK hit 14.4 points per game in 2021 and 17 in 2020. I think it's a lot likelier that the 2020 was an outlier year when Russ started cooking than for 17 to be DK's norm. I think we all have a much higher opinion of DK in our head as a real-life football player than as a fantasy asset. 
And now they've brought in uh, JSN. He's playing next to Lockett still, who has outscored him like the last two years. Uh, so I'd rather have a lot of guys that are going right by DK at ADP. Guys like Josh Jacobs, who will probably give you better production, or someone with more value upside like Drake London. Yeah, I mean, you said he's only had one season over 14.4 points per game. Really only one difference-making season. And he's going to turn 26 this year. They added a first-round rookie to the offense. For where I'm sitting, it just seems like he's more likely to lose value than to gain value. Mm. And he's probably not going to provide a difference-making season this year or maybe ever again just based on you know what he's been able to do the past couple of years, the added competition of the offense. It just seems like there's more downside than upside, which is really what we're highlighting here. Not players you can't roster, players that have more risk, players where risk is not fully baked into the price tag. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think we're seeing here with DK. Whereas somebody like Drake London, who's going much uh, very close to him, or JSN even, who's going really close to him as well, I would rather have those players because I think they have as good or better chance of providing difference-making production while having a lot more value insulation due to their age and the, the place they are in their careers. So DK Metcalf is our second uh, player on this list. Next, we have Saquon Barkley, who is going at the 309 as the sixth running back off the board. And honestly, I think he's going to drop with this holdout stuff coming, which I think is kind of funny because I don't think there's any actual chance he's going to hold out. Um, but maybe it'll correct his price to a more reasonable place because I, I think... He's way too risky for this price tag. Frankly, I think his upside is overstated just due to the the insane rookie year that he had. Since then, he really hasn't had any huge seasons. Like last year, he only scored 17.8 points per game, which was pretty good in the context of last year's running back scoring. But if you look at like you look at the average year where that would rank, and it, it's not breaking your league. 18 points per game is really not that high. And considering that he was second in snap share and third in opportunity share amongst all running backs, I just don't know how much more room there is to grow. Like, do, are we really expecting him to have more usage than last year or to be significantly better than he was last year now that he's a year older? For me, it seems like there's a little bit of just name value here uh, where the actual point scoring ceiling isn't different than like Ramondre Stevenson, Tony Pollard, Josh Jacobs, who are all going over a round later. Uh, and yet Barkley's the oldest of the group and also has the highest ADP. Yeah. I mean, I, I, you've pretty much covered everything I had written down. Um, I think, yeah, what you, what you're saying is a lot of his price, I think is narrative where I think everyone was so happy. Saquon was back. I say in air quotes that mm -hmm. they didn't realize he isn't actually back. Like he didn't top 18 points per game last year. He is, I don't want to say it was mediocre production. Like he was, I still think the RB five or RB six in points per game. But his pass catching abilities in that offense seem pretty stunted from what we saw last year. Like he only averaged the 10th most targets per game with four while having the fifth highest target share. So like he's not getting that many targets as a number, although he still demands a large percentage of targets. Um, but yeah, like he's playing on the tag. He's 26. I would just rather have those guys that are going around or half around later. Like, yeah, think Gable. about Go ahead. Yeah, uh, like, and also I'm I don't like ETN, but I'd still rather have ETN at price over Saquon at price. Yeah, exactly. It comes down to the price. There's just too much risk baked in. And think about the offense that he's in, right? Like Daniel Jones isn't Lamar Jackson, but he is a mobile quarterback, which means there's less checkdowns. It also means that he's going to steal some goal line opportunities. Uh, I think Daniel Jones had seven rushing touchdowns last year, so that does take away some opportunities for Saquon in the passing game and near the goal line. Those are the high value touches. That's not going to change this year necessarily. You know, we could see maybe he gets lucky. He gets a few more of those touchdowns, but he's pretty maxed out in terms of his usage right now. So it's just, it's hard to envision him putting together like a truly league breaking season. And when you have a 26 year old running back going in the top three rounds, you want them to have that like Christian McCaffrey type ceiling. And he, right. he doesn't have it anymore. Um, but that does bring us to our next guy who is in fact, Christian McCaffrey. He's 27 years old. He's going at the 205 as the second running back off the board in dynasty startups. So Malcolm, make the case. Why is there too much risk involved with Christian McCaffrey at this price? So when you first told me we were going to be discussing Christian McCaffrey, the only thing I wrote down was old. And then you told me, no, you have to write more than that. So <laughs> instead, I'm going to be citing a really 
a good analyst who I'm very good friends with named Paul Patterson. He said uh, since 2018, McCaffrey, in the games he's played at least 50% of the snaps, has averaged 25.9 points per game. Like, that's insane production. McCaffrey is really the last running back that's still giving you game-breaking production. Uh, But like I said, the only word I put was old. So McCaffrey, yeah, he's 27. I think no matter what, even if he gives a 25 point per game season, he's probably going to lose value. Like his value is pretty high uh, or his uh, ADP is pretty high. Like I, I, as you said, he's the RB two getting drafted at the two Oh five. I just don't see a way in which he goes up in value. But again, if you are drafting him and you're competing or if you're trading for him, which I'm look, I like trading for Chris McCaffrey much more than drafting him. Uh, and you can shoulder that risk, then get the production you're going to get is almost guaranteed to be amazing. But the only problem is that when you draft him at the 205, he just locks you into a competing build. So I really like trading for him a lot more than drafting him in the startup. Yeah, I agree with that. And that's actually where I think a lot of the risk lies. So like you cited, that brilliant analyst, their tweet uh, really highlights just how dominant Christian McCaffrey's been in his games. And I think he can continue that. Uh, the problem is it does lock you into a strategy, which is risky in the sense that the draft room that you're in might not end up being conducive to an aggressively win now strategy. So you take McCaffrey in the second round, you know, what if multiple other teams take an aggressive approach as well? And then you don't get any of the good values on those win now pieces. And instead you're left with a bunch of, you know, you get good value on Drake London, you get good value on like rookie wide receivers and, I don't know, rookie tight ends and young players that aren't going to help you. Then all of a sudden you have this lopsided team. You got to try to fix it. It's just tricky to draft him at the 205, you know, drafting him ahead of Brees Hall, drafting him ahead of a lot of those elite quarterbacks we talked about in the main show. Um, that's just too risky for me because if he suffers any kind of injury, I mean, he's a, it's over for McCaffrey. Like, I don't even think it's a bat, it's wrong to draft a player you know is going down in value. Mm-hmm. But for him, it's just really... It's really precarious at that price. Um, We're going to close things out here with the number one risky player to avoid, and that's Justin Fields. So he goes at the 110 as the QB8. And Malcolm and I are both pro elite quarterback in startups, so we won't tell you that you can't draft Justin Fields. But of the first-round startup quarterbacks, he does feel by far the riskiest. Uh, Just because he's played two years in the league and he has not shown the ability to be a quality passer. Uh, He ranked last year, 28th in adjusted yards per attempt, 32nd in true completion percentage and 27th in clean pocket completion percentage. Granted, he didn't have a lot of weapons, but he took a lot of sacks. It really wasn't all on the offensive line. Their line really wasn't that bad last year. Um, He needs to take a huge step and they added DJ Moore, but it remains to be seen whether that's going to be enough. And if he does continue to pass at the level we've seen throughout these two years, he's not going to maintain his first round price tag. Yeah. I mean, I totally agree. I think it's really, really lazy to say that he got DJ Moore, So now he's going to make the Josh Allen Jalen hurts jump. Like we saw last year that Zach Wilson got Garrett Wilson. And then he just still couldn't hit the broad side of a barn. Like there's nothing (laughs) that has been conducive to showing that Justin Fields is a good real life passer in the NFL. Like they just had the first overall pick. Usually I don't think QB wins are a super big thing, but chances are, if you're a good quarterback, your team is not going to have the first overall pick. Um, I've seen that his expected points per game are almost four points per game, less than his actual points per game. This shows that his rushing production while not fraudulent, like he's obviously an amazing rusher. It might be a little bit too overly efficient where we've seen we're seeing some outlier efficiency there. So he has to almost give us better passing by a good margin uh, to uh, uh, make sure that he keeps his his startup value. Exactly. We could he could take a little dip if he doesn't make that jump as a passer. You think of Anthony Richardson as a risky player, right? But he actually has more value insulation at this point than Fields because he's a rookie. He's going to be granted a lot of grace to grow as a passer. Whereas with Fields, we are expecting it to come right now. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't come this year, he is going to tumble. So by all means, like get an elite quarterback. And if that's Fields, if that's the guy you can get, then get him. But know that there is risk and maybe look for options to pivot into someone safer, like somebody like a Justin Herbert or 
even somebody like uh, a Kyler Murray, I think is safer because he has shown the ability to play. It's just a matter of health with him. So just be careful, be wary to recap. That's Jordan love DK Metcalf, Saquon Barkley, Christian McCaffrey, and Justin Fields. Those are five risky players. You might want to avoid in startups. Um, and again, this has been the factory tour. Make sure you tune in next week. Mm -hmm.